So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kimberly Peterson. I'm the Deputy Director with the County of Santa Cruz Human Services Department. And um, I'll be getting us started today. So this is a meeting regarding the um, core investments um, RFP cycle um, that um, will be for the fiscal years 25 through 28. Uh, with me today, I have um, George, Mal George Malachowski. He is with the Human Services Department as well, Planning and Evaluation Division. Uh, Larry M. Wally with the City of Santa Cruz. And um, uh, the core consultants team, Nicole Young, Nicole Lezen, Crystal Caballero, and, um, and Gisela Carrasco. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, so today's, uh, today's meeting is uh, being recorded. And just to let you know what we'll be, um, the purpose of today is to make sure that you know where to find information on the website regarding the core RFP process, how to access the reviewer tool, which is the online portal that uh, you will utilize to apply um, submit a proposal for core funding. We'll also make sure that you know how to ask questions during the application process and where responses will be posted. And we'll also make sure that you know how to sign up for training and technical assistance, as well as provide an opportunity, opportunity for you to inquire about the RFP or the process. And so the, for the agenda today, um, this is the, the order we will go by. Um, uh, just did the agenda review. Uh, we'll take some time to go through the core website and a walkthrough of the request for proposals document, the application document. Um, George and I will do that. And then George will take you on a walkthrough of the reviewer tool against that online portal that you'll use, use to apply. Then we'll have a um, short break to allow, you, you know, a break for all of us to have a um, time away from the computer. And then we'll come back um, and the core consultant team will go over training and technical assistance opportunities. And then um, Larry will facilitate the questions and response. And then finally, at the end, we'll look at the timeline, um, an addendum that you can anticipate um, to be coming out, and uh, next steps. All right. All right, so I'm going to let um, Nicole Lezen describe how to use Zoom. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. On your Zoom screen, if you're not familiar, um, there there is an option to mute and unmute yourself. So we'll ask you to be muted during the presentations. That's the little audio button, usually on the, the far left of the control bar. And then you can turn your camera on and off with that stop video that shows the little camera icon. And um, you can change your um, identification in the participants list. For example, if you wanted to add um, the, the name of the agency that you're representing today or add pronouns or anything like that, you can do that from clicking on your um, identifier in the participants list. We encourage everyone to use the chat to share questions and comments throughout today's session. And we'll be trying to track those questions for the discussion that can really mention would be occurring later in today's session. And you can also use the reactions button um, to raise your hand, to um, share feedback during today's session. And if you're having any trouble at all with any of the Zoom functions or hearing us or, or anything like that, just feel free to send a private chat to, uh, to me, Nicole Lezen, or any member of the team, and we'll do our best to help you out. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the HSD team. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So, um, so today is 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 one opportunity to ask questions, but not the last opportunity. Um, Nicole just covered a bit uh, how to how you can ask questions, raising your hand or putting them in the chat. 
Um, not all questions may be uh, may be answered today, um, but we they will be um, tracked in and posted on our Q&A document. Um, and uh, some of you may have already submitted some questions and we will be posting our first um, question and response document by the end of the day today. The um, final opportunity to ask questions will be um, end of day, July 1st. And uh, we will make sure to respond to all questions by, um, by July 8th to provide um, sufficient time for people to complete their applications. And all this information will be um, posted on the Human Services Department core webpage, which um, you will see in just a bit here. All right. Okay. So here is the core webpage, and thank you for putting the link in the chat as well. Um, this is the Human Services Department webpage. Um, you can see that there's um, information for the current RFP funding cycle in this box to the far left, where it says click here for fiscal years 22 through 25. Um, that's just an FYI, what you're really here for today is that middle box, uh, click, for, click for core investments, fiscal years 25, 28. Um, that is where you can access the materials for the current core fund, excuse me, for the core RFP that we're discussing right now um, that will be due on August 2nd. And you can see there's a, um, a brief overview of the um, announcement of the core RFP. Um, there's also, there's a, a handful of links that you may find useful. Um, before we delve uh, into the RFP itself, which can also be accessed through this webpage, I just wanna mention that you can see on the right side of the webpage, there's information about training and uh, technical assistance. Um, but again, uh, the core consultant team will just will talk about uh, a little bit more later to this morning. Um, let's see. And so from this page, if you can go ahead and go back there. We lost it for a minute, George. All right, so, um, so from this page, um, there's also the, um, you can see very specific, um, you see this chart at the bottom that says core RFP timeline. I just wanna call your attention to the two in that area. Just about the timeline, there's a handful of links to specific items related to the RFP. You've got the link to the core RFP itself, the application questions, a link to the scoring criteria, the budget template, and the leveraging template. So just to call out those direct links. And then below that is the uh, a chart that shows the overall uh, timeline for the RFP that we're discussing right now. Also has information regarding the applicant conference, which you are now attending. And Below that, you can see the link for individualized online portal support. That's the support for the reviewer tool that you will be using to submit an application. And then finally, at the bottom is just a, a visual graphic of uh, how the core funding is um, being distributed for the, this next round. Um, it's got the approximate funding for the total core investments. Sure, thank you. Um, we've, it's got funding for the total core investments. It has the, um, the amount that is being set aside for stable and affordable housing, which is actually gonna be handled through a separate process, not this RFP that we're discussing right now. And it has, in that green circle, you can see um, this RFP, 
that we're discussing right now um, it has a total amount of about 3.79 million um, it distributed through three priority core conditions, um, driving families, lifelong learning, and healthy environments. And then it also calls out that there's a portion of funding that will be available to the elected officials to address any unanticipated priorities that weren't identified at the time of the RFP. Um, let me check, can you, can you all hear me okay? Okay, if at any point, uh, I'll try to talk louder. I know I have a soft voice, just um, just keep letting me know. One thing I'll just add, Kimberly, for the group, this is also where the recordings from this meeting and the transcript will be posted, as well as that individualized online portal support, and then some of the in individualized technical assistance that um, Nicole Young and Nicole Lesnar provided. Those resources will be posted here. If you know anyone in your organization that would benefit from viewing those um, and don't, don't, doesn't, didn't have the opportunity to come to this meeting or other meetings. Thank you, George. All right, so now um, I think we can go ahead and Okay, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and I guess I'll go ahead and try and address questions as they come up. And then if, but if it seems like we're falling um, a bit behind, then I may just save them to the end. Okay, so I see um, a question in the chat. Is there an idea of distribution across the three priority areas? And um, there is, there is not a, there, the RFP um, nor the board did not give direction about specific dollar amounts that will be allocated to each priority area. Um, rather, when we come back and provide um, the, uh, the summary of awards, then the board would make the final decision. And- uh, Sorry, Kimberly, but just to, to add to that, so we'll, we'll be going to the board and council and. September with details about the application patterns for the RFP and that will be an opportunity um, for them, for the, the, the board and the council to weigh in on what their priority is for the funding of the three uh, core conditions. Yeah, thank you. All right. And then maybe a thing that we have a handful of, um, I'll, I'll finish these these last two questions and then go ahead and get back to the PowerPoint and then we can resume the Q&A at the end. Um, so the question, is there a timeline for the stable and affordable housing RFP? I don't have that information right now since that is being handled separate, uh, completely separate from this RFP. Um, at the moment, I don't have that answer. The, um, question, how were the three priority areas chosen? Um, it was based on a, a formula and in, in some information and data that was provided to the board in, Dece in December, identifying areas where there was um, uh, the least amount of general fund investment among the core conditions. And then finally, our 501 um, C6 or organizations eligible to apply. When we go through the RFP, we'll be going through um, what, um, what the eligible categories are for, to apply. And then I think probably we should go ahead and move into the core RFP and because some of these questions may be answered through that review. And so um, you can see here, here's some of the categories that we're gonna be sure to touch on when we look at the core RFP. Um, I'll be using this as a guide and George and I will, are going to continue to tag team as we go through the RFP highlights um, so that uh, for your viewing, we're actually going to go to, excuse me, the, the RFP uh, live on the screen and then we'll be scrolling through that in front of you. And George, are you able to add that one too, or should I share my screen for that? Yeah, I was just adding the link to the RFP in case anyone wants to have it open while we go ahead and I'm going to bring up the RFP on screen now. 
Thank you. Okay. And just to check, um, can most of you, can most people read this as we've, we've made it a bit larger on the screen? Okay. All right, so um, this first part's the general description about core investments and what it is. Uh, collective, uh, collective impact funding model as well as a movement. Here it gets to specifically which organizations are eligible to apply. Um, nonprofit 501c3s, federally recognized tribal entities, and tax exempt educational entities. Uh, nonprofit 501c3s acting as fiscal sponsors or elite fiscal agency are able to apply for um, programs which they have fiscal oversight. So that answers one of the questions that had come up in the chat earlier. Um, and then we also have some, so the core, the core RFP is based on a results-based accountability framework. So when you go through the application, you will see that a lot of the questions are based on these core questions. Um, how, uh, how much are programs or services able to achieve? Um, how well are the programs or services provided? And is anyone better off as a result of the programs or services? And you can see within, a, within each of these broad categories, there's some sub bullets about examples for how many services are provided, um, what are the number of unduplicated people served and their demographics. Uh, we also um, request that uh, applicants will, people who are ultimately awarded funding um, will conduct a participant survey asking um, clients how satisfied they are with their services. And then of course we um, also will track outcome indicators. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I feel like one thing I just wanna mention a lot of um, for, I'm, I'm guessing, Probably many of you on the call probably are maybe somewhat familiar with CORE, but it's really um, you know that data-driven, um, evidence-based, um, collective impact-driven, and so a lot of what you'll see in the RFP um, questions and and what you'll um, see from the supporting tools is really to try and continue to demonstrate like how do we get at the impact that we want to have for the populations that you propose to serve? Okay, so um, some other um, areas to be, um, things to be aware of. Um, okay, if, if, um, if any agency is awarded funding, um, there may be, there's a chance that um, application proposals, their budgets may be trimmed up to 5%. Um, and that, um, the reason for that is just provide a bit of flexibility to us as um, the county and city to make sure that all of the core funds are expended. So um, what I mean is, let's say that, um, you know, we don't know at this point the number of applications that we will receive or the dollar amounts that each application will represent. But we do know that we want to expend all the available core funding and we intend to fund uh, the you know, applications to their fullest extent. However, if all of the recommended awards don't fit perfectly, you know, perfectly together in a way that expends all the core funding, we may need to make some minor trims around the edges. Um, up to 5% to ensure that we can um, fund the recommended awards and expend uh, the full um, pot of money available. Uh, okay, um, and also um, regarding, I'm on 2.4 multiple proposals here. Uh, you can see that while there's no limit to the number of proposals submitted per agency, there are some proposal parameters um, to be aware of. Um, 
Agencies may not submit a proposal for a program or project to more than one funding tier or more than one core condition. So you can't take one application that is just submitted multiple times in different tiers or um, uh, for you know, different core conditions. Um, a proposal submitted must not have an aggregate total of more than 25% of the total core funding available. And there was a question in the chat about what, you know, where does that 25% apply to? Um, the 25% applies to the 3.79 million that's available for this core RFP. And, and when we post the Q and A's, we'll, there was a question that came up about this and we'll post the very specific dollar amount that is the maximum. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, also for priorities, we have some um, prioritized core conditions of lifelong learning and education, uh, thriving families, and healthy environments. And here, um, there is also some examples of impact statements related to these core conditions. Uh, we have received a handful of um, very good questions related to the impact statements. And so um, we'll be providing more clarification on um, those impact statements uh, with the Q&A and uh, possibly an addendum next week. Uh, one thing that I will say is that overall with the core funding, it's really intended for direct services to clients, and you will see that in the um, as you go through the application as well. I feel like I'm missing something here. Um, I'll just go on to the, the funding tiers and we'll have time for Q&A later. Okay, so um, funding tiers, um, for those of you that are familiar with CORE from um, the prior RFP period, um, there's different funding amounts people can apply for. Um, so we consider them tiers one, two, and three. Tier one is the largest tier, and those would be um, organizations that, that are submitting uh, proposals for anywhere from just over $150,000 up to $500,000. Uh, tier applications, excuse me, um, proposals submitted in the core conditions for lifelong learning and education and thriving families can submit um, applications in the tier one category. Uh, tier two applications are those um, for which the request is just over 25,000, so 25,001 dollar up to $150,000. And uh, proposals across any of these three core conditions can be submitted um, within the tier two category. And then uh, tier three proposals, this, these are the smaller grants. Um, these are for proposals for dollar amounts um, up to $25,000. And those can be submitted across any of these three core conditions. Uh, okay, a couple additional notes here. Um, it's kind of been mentioned, no agency can apply for more than 25% of the core funding available through this RFP. And um, if an agency's total um, revenue exceeds 7.5 million, then the agency cannot apply for the tier three funding category or that small grant category. Uh, core funding must be utilized to serve Santa Cruz County residents. Uh, any agencies that are funded will be required to support to report semi-annually on their program activities and um, using an outcomes-based and results-based accountability framework. I will mention we attempted to design the application um, so that it could transition nicely into a, an RBA-based uh, contract for those who are awarded funding. Uh, we also, I mentioned, we, this is, you know, it's, you know, we, we, data is an important part of this process. And so 
Programs will be required to collect standardized client satisfaction um, data, data um, and also um, include data based solely based on the core funding. The data is due at the end of each fiscal year and an annual progress report will be required. Um, and in that same, on the, at the bottom of that page, uh, you can see we also ask for unduplicated um, program participant information. Uh, so let's see, should I take a couple questions, George, or should we keep going? Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, right. if, you, if you see one that we can, can touch on. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm reading from where we left off previously. Uh, actually, I hear I see at the top from Stacy Kyle is the 3.79 million amount the expected annual allocation from the. Uh, yes, that's the annual amount. Um, uh, let's see the next one regarding results based accountability. Will there be a consideration of outcomes, quality measures, and other measures of current contractor performance in the decision-making process for recommended awards for the next cycle? Um, let me come back to that one if I can. I do have an answer, um, but it's just a little bit more complicated, so I can maybe get the more technical questions out of the way at the moment. Um, uh, can an NPO submit one RFP for the entire organization? Um, we actually, uh, this question from um, Teresa, we actually address this in the, um, in the Q&A. And again, it's slightly, uh, it's a slightly more detailed question. So I'd almost uh, rather leave that for later if we have time, uh, but I can tell you we respond. We did respond to that in the Q&A that will be posted today. Um, do the proposal limitations apply across this RFP and the housing RFP? Uh, I, I think this means the 25% cap. Um, this is specific to this RFP. Uh, the housing, the housing, um, the stable and affordable housing RFP uh, will be handled through a different process. Are the tiers based on total or annual amounts? They are, that would be the, so uh, when proposals are submitted, the request should be the same for each year. So um, for example, if you request $50,000 annually, it'd be 50,000 year one, 50,000 year two, 50,000 in year three. Um, can an organization decide? Really, can I, which, can uh, I yeah. jump in on that last one? Yeah. Um, so then an organization that wants to apply in, for instance, tier three, the up to 25,000, that's if they're asking for 25,000 per year, not 25,000 total across the three years. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Can an organization decide which of the tiers to apply for? Uh, yes, organizations can decide which organization to apply for. And it's really up to the um, organization based on the amount of funding that you're requesting. I'm reading now, how will the core funding only work with the leveraging of funds? For example, if we are using core funds to match or leverage other funds, do we count all services or just the percent proportional to core funding? I'm not sure. I think Kimberly, this is this is answered in our question response. It's something that we've gotten a few times and we know that a lot of agencies leverage core funds. And so the braided funding can be difficult to tease out what the core funds, what core funds are used to impact 
clients. And so we ask agencies to do the best they they can. If that means you think doing proportional of your clients with the funding is the way that you want to report, then that's acceptable. And that it is, we do speak to it more in more depth in the um, question response document, which will be posted this, uh, this afternoon. Thank you, George. Uh, okay. Um, if we are a current awardee, but we were not able to meet all of our goals um, for something out of our control, does this count against us when we reapply? Um, I think that falls into the same category as another question that was asked earlier. So if I can just save the response to that for a little bit later. Uh, we did discuss this uh, pretty explicitly at the Board of Supervisors meeting. And uh, and I and so I can I'll, I'll reference that a bit later in this meeting. In, in short, each each RFP it's a it's a new it's a brand new application. It's like a it's a new cycle. Um, as as long as um, an organization is not disqualified from uh, being funded um, and receiving funds from the county. Uh, let's see, does unduplicated program participants mean people can only participate in the program once? Uh, I, I would respond to that with a no, um, but George, I don't know if you have any additional clarification, but the people can, each program will be different and it doesn't mean people yeah. can participate once. Just Certainly some program is designed for, for several interactions with clients, but in reporting, you would only count that client once for the purposes of services given to, to clients and the demographics of, the, of who you're serving. Mm -hmm. All right. Will all the RFPs be evaluated together or are there goals for funding of each core condition? and the various tiers. Um, let's see, I'm thinking, I'm guessing, I'm thinking that this means, oh, let me have it. All the, there's the prioritized core conditions of that we've mentioned previously, the lifelong learning education, healthy environments and thriving families. Within those categories, uh, across those categories, the, uh, the proposals will be reviewed and scored. And then at the end, we will, re we will bring um, recommended awards to the board. Prior to that, we will, as George mentioned uh, earlier in the meeting, be going to the board with a summary of the proposals received. Um, but this, at this point in time, let's see. There, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I'm thinking that this might be similar to the question that asked are there specific like dollar amounts out allocated to the different core conditions? And at this point in time, there's there's not. Uh, George, you think I'm answering that question appropriately? I think so. I think um, just in, in general, all of the, the proposals will go through a panelist process and be ranked. Um, and that will determine how the, um, you know, proposals get recommended to the board and the council for for funding and so the um you know we'll have um probably a number of panels that are rating applications in different um buckets and they will likely be in the those buckets will be the core conditions um, that those proposals will be reviewed in Um, okay. This question, I, I don't feel I can answer this right now. Can we apply for the same project under this RFP and the housing RFP? Uh, 
I would have to hold off on that since the housing RFP is a completely separate process. Um, but you can submit. And if you have a program that falls into one of the core condition, prioritized core conditions, you can of course submit a proposal through this RFP. Uh, are services delivered in the city of Watsonville ineligible for core funding? And somebody's responded to that. So yes, uh, there's they're not ineligible. Um, okay. Can homelessness prevention or intervention program proposals be submitted if they meet the focus? Um, so this question um, will also be in the Q&A document. Uh, and generally, we're just saying that if you have a program that fits into one of the prioritized core conditions, you can apply for that program. Um, and we'll have and we'll have more more detail on that in our Q and A document. I think I think you got to to you mostly everything. So I think we can move into the next section. Thank you, Kimberly. And again, all of these questions um, that you've been providing in chat, and then we will give in um, our request and response period will also be included as questions in our response document that will be published July 8th. So just know that there will be um, you know, formal responses to all of these questions in that document um, that can that will be shared with, with all um, everyone in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, and so um, next section that we wanted to speak to was the um, sample um, proposal, uh, which is in the RFP. And as you may have seen on the HSD core website, we also have it as a separate document to make it easier to access on the website. Um, again, this is a sample. Uh, we are only accepting um, proposals through reviewer, which I will um, go through uh, in our next section. Uh, but in case it is useful, we wanted to provide um, the application. Uh, we know some people prefer to, to kind of write out their responses in something like Word before they put it into the online um, system. So again, this has all of the same questions as on the online portal, and you can um, browse through it and, um, and um, look at what needs to be responded to. Um, it also includes some links um, to data share and some other sources that might help you with the uh, your proposal. <clears throat> and I will caveat that even though we list data share as, a, as one resource, um, you may use other resources um, in your proposal um, when you're talking about um, data or evidence um, for your, your program responses. So also included in this document is the, uh, the evaluation. And so there's two places that you can see the scoring. Um, the first is a, um, an overview in this um, proposal response format. You can see that we have um, the first two sections, which is your summary and contact information and your program background are not scored, they're just for informational purposes and for organizing um, the proposals. The um, next sections that are scored um, are the statement of needs and strengths of idea, which is worth um, 20 points um, through several questions, and then the proposed approach, which should be done, which is worth 35. Um, the who do you intend to serve, um, which is worth 15 points, uh, your capacity to provide services, which is worth 20 points. You'll be providing a, a budget through a budget template, which will be worth 10 points. And then for tiers one and two, um, there's five bonus points available for leveraging, and there's a template to show how you're leveraging. And we do take a fairly broad um, view of what leveraging is, realizing that that comes in many different forms in the community. It could be funds, technical assistance, donated services, or just anything that you uh, can put a dollar value equivalent to. 
Um, and then as, as part of our um, lessons learned from the last RFP process, we got a lot of um, requests to include the scoring criteria that will be used by the panelists um, to score your proposals. And so in the, on the RFP, um, you'll see this, um, oops, that's not the, sorry, uh, went to the wrong place. Let me find it. Yes, I had it. I thought I had it queued up, but I don't apparently. Okay. Um, yeah, here we are. My apologies. Um, so this is Appendix B, the proposal scoring criteria. And so uh, we will be training all of our panelists using this document to standardize how they're um, reviewing proposals and then scoring them. You'll see the scoring um, distribution um, is at the top of the document, which we went over, um, that is also in the other um, location in the RFP. And in general, all um, questions will be ranked on a basically a, a, a six point scale uh, going from inadequate, which will essentially be zero points all the way to exemplary, which would be full um, points for a question. And so um, in particular, um, something that's incomplete um, would address the question briefly or indirectly, lack sufficient detail or clarity and need more information to assess the response needs improvement would fall between incomplete and acceptable. Acceptable would demonstrate a basic understanding of the question or component, uh, but could be more detailed, thorough, or explicit. And then good would fall between acceptable and exemplary, and exemplary would be addressing the question, you know, clear, well-reasoned, comprehensive, and thorough, and demonstrates a deep knowledge uh, and experience related to the question or component. And I'll just show you one, um, example of what that looks like um, and i'm not going to go through every single one but just so how that would play out for example in the needs and strengths which asks about how do the inequities um, contribute to the needs challenge or issues the program will address and who it impacts you know so zero would mean that that the, the response didn't address equity at all you know they're you're know, unable to score it incomplete it would mention it briefly or indirectly but lack detail or clarity uses very little data stories or other information to describe the inequity and doesn't make uh, an explicit connection between the inequity and the core condition selected um, acceptable you provide a clear well reasoned description as who has experienced the problem um, or need uh, to a greater degree than others and then uses and cites community data stories and other types of i'm sorry this goes over the page information and then makes an explicit connection between the core condition and but um, and this is what differentiates it from exemplary you know it could be more detailed through or explicit um and exemplary it's those same things as acceptable <clears throat> and um tells a clear, cohesive story that can conveys a clear understanding. And so um, you'll see for each question, it goes into that level of detail. And again, I'm not going to go through every single one, but to give you a sense of what you'll be looking at if you're, you're looking at the scoring criteria. Um, and we hope that helps you um, craft your answers and understand how the proposals will be scored in a, in a comprehensive manner. So I'm going to um, pause there um, and see if there's any before I, I'm the next I'm going to jump into reviewer. I'm just going to see um, so anything. And so um, the uh, to answer uh, Carol's question about the dedicated grant writer. Um, 
There is no uh, impact on the scoring for this response. This was something that um, our board of supervisors was particularly interested in understanding for agencies in the community applying to core, what resources they had available. And so this will be uh, simply informational to report back to the council and the board. Um, and then to Helen's question about what time today, we are um, uh, working on getting it posted by five o'clock today, or ho hopefully a little bit earlier than that, but that's, um, we have a, a little bit of fine tuning and so it'll be out, out by then. <clears throat> okay, I think those are all the, um, so where do you find this document? I will post the link in chat. Uh, you can click on that to to get to the to the RFP. Okay, so the um, <clears throat> next topic um, is reviewer. Um, I've I've seen it uh, and viewing it. Some people have logged in. Uh, I'm not going to go through the full reviewer, just do a very kind of broad overview. Um, and then we have that more intensive um, reviewer training, which will be done next week on the 26th. Um, I know uh, Giselle is gonna uh, post these links in the chat, um, but I'm just gonna kind of go through. So if you click on oops, um, the link, um, it'll be taken to the splash page. If you do not have an account, um, you can create one. If you do, you can click log in. Um, when you log in and start working on your um, submission, you'll see this blank. And this is one that I've done for myself. It's a, obviously not a real um, submission, but you'll add um, your information and then there's um, uh, this one I've already submitted, so you'll see some some fake answers. But in one that has not been submitted, you'll see boxes where you can enter in um, in those. And then one other thing that I wanted to um, point out is that once you've submitted your application and you log back in, you will see this button in the upper right hand corner that says "Add Another Submission." And I saw a question in the chat. It is really up to you and your organization whether you want to have one person submitting all proposals or if you want to create separate um, logins for people to work on different proposals. I will say that there's no um, way for two different logins to work on the same proposal. Um, you'd have to share that login with two different people in your agencies in order for you both to log in and work on a, a proposal. So it, it's really up to you and your um, work process on whether and how you want to use Reviewer, whether you want to use one login across your agency for multiple proposals or have separate logins for different proposals. And I think uh, that answered. Um, and then I, uh, I will just, uh, pause and say for Kayla, um, for the financial information, and this is a one that we responded to because there were other people who asked the same question, it's, it's the most current um, information you have for those documents. So if it's the last fiscal year, please use that. If for some reason you don't have those available, it's whatever is the most recent for your organization. So what we're requesting. So uh, next on our agenda, we're going to, I'm going to turn it over to the core consultants to go over the uh, training so supports available for this RFP. I'll turn it to you, Nicole. Great. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, so again, I'm Nicole Young. I'm one of the consultants that supports the county and the city um, on core investments and particularly during this RFP application cycle. And my colleagues, Nicole Lezen and Crystal Caballero are also on today's call. And so um, during this application period, we are available to provide a, a variety of training and technical assistance to applicants. 
Um, and so our role is different from the counties in that like the types of questions that um, Kimberly and George were answering earlier in this session, you know, questions about what does the RFP say? What do you mean by this? <laughs> what are the parameters? Those are all the kinds of questions that are really good and relevant to ask the county. And then if you want some additional guidance and tools and tips around how to uh, answer these questions in the application and address things or incorporate things like the core conditions for health and well-being and collective impacts and equity or different approaches to program planning and evaluation. If you're looking for tools and guidance and support around that to help you then craft those responses in your applications that will hopefully get you those exemplary ratings, um, that's what we are available to do. And so if you uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see some of the areas and, and tools and um, resources that we'll cover. So for those of you, if you're not very familiar with DataShare Santa Cruz County, we can provide some guidance and help you figure out like how to use that site, what you, the types of things that you will find on DataShare versus uh, where you might reach a point where you have to look in other places or other websites to find data that will help support um, your application. Um, there are a number of core tools that we've developed over the years that actually live on DataShare so that it's integrated with data that's available. So things like the core results menu that just provides that overall organizing framework for the core conditions and what impact statements fall under each one. And then when data is available for indicators, that's where you can find it. So we can offer guidance. Those are some of the things that we're covering in our trainings, as well as there's a, a complementary tool that goes along with the core results menu called the strategies and programs program outcomes tool. That can be helpful if you're looking for ideas or sample language about how to phrase activities or phrase your outcomes. So again, we cover how to use these tools in the trainings, and then you can use the office hours or individualized TA sessions to get more specific um, support around how they might be useful in your applications. Um, there's a particular question in the application that asks you to place your program that you are proposing to say where it falls along the core continuum of results and evidence. So again, that's a specific tool that we've developed a number of years ago um, through the tr training in TA, we can help you understand like how to use that tool so that you can figure decide how you wanna answer that question. So these are just a few of the tools and resources that we're sharing in the trainings and office hours and TA sessions. And if you look on the next slide, Let me advance to the next slide. <laughs> is that George, is that you that's advancing slides? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so, and we've seen several of you in the training and TA sessions already, and we love that. So we encourage others to also make use of this. Um, the trainings are more like structured content. We come with a presentation and tools and, uh, practice worksheets and really try to provide you with um, information that we think, again, will help you think about how you wanna go about answering the questions. Those trainings are um, done in English with simultaneous Spanish interpretation. They're recorded, they're made available afterwards along with any of the slides and materials that we share during the training. The office hours are more informal uh, where we don't have a particular presentation you can sign up for a session and we do them by core condition. Uh, interpretation is available if it's requested in advance, but we don't record the office hours because really it's your chance to just bring whatever questions you have and we talk through them as a group. The more individualized support is offered through the TA sessions. So we're offering up to two sessions per application. And again, those are done in English unless you request interpretation in advance. Those are also not recorded because those are really your time to talk about specifically your proposal. So we don't record them um, or, you know, yeah, we don't record them. 
So there's a couple different links. Um, the website that George shared earlier that or Kimberly shared earlier for HSD's site that contains all the information about the RFP, that's kind of your one-stop shop. Find everything you need on that site. The links about the training TA actually lead you back to the core scc.org slash events site where you'll find a list of all of the upcoming training and TA offerings, the registration links, we have a specific link if you want to sign up for your initial TA session. And we're suggesting that if you want individualized support, sign up for your first session like now. Uh, do that between, have your first session between now and July 8th. So we can get a sense, you know, we can be thought partners for you as you're getting started on your applications. And then we'll work with you to schedule your second session if you would like that. Uh, once you've gotten farther into your writing, uh, you might have just different questions, different needs as you get farther along. And the next slide shows our upcoming trainings and office hours sessions. So we have, again, our training topics have been loosely following basically the sections of the application. So we're trying to uh, focus our support and resources to correspond with uh, what you'll need to be responding to in the application. Uh, we have one more set of office hours coming up on July 2nd. July 12th is really just kind of a, you know, if you couldn't attend the earlier trainings, but you just want the highlights, we'll do a final wrap up. That will be our last structured training. Everything after July 12th will just be the individualized TA sessions. So that's why we're Encourage everyone to sign up for your initial one sooner rather than later so that we have plenty of time after July 12th to also um, provide, provide your second session. If you're looking for the recordings and materials from previous trainings that were recorded, you can see on the next slide, we have a list of what we've already offered. Uh, and so once we have the link ready with the videos and the slides that have all been uh, edited and made sure that they are, um, that they meet the Americans with Disability Acts standards, then we will post them on the core website that we maintain. Uh, so you can see that there are some links that are pending for um, some of the events we've already done. And I believe that Gisela, we have already put those links in the chat where you can find, um, yes, our full list of, uh, events, the TA sign-up sheet, and where you, the resources page where you can find all the previous recordings. That's it for us. Thank you, Nicole. And I think, uh, George, do we want to come back to this at, at the end and do the Q&A right now? Yeah, perfect. Um, Larry, do you want to go ahead and facilitate the Q&A and we'll do our best to respond as we can? Yeah, great. Happy to. Good morning, everybody. I'm Larry and Wally uh, with the city manager's office in the city of Santa Cruz. And thank you for all your questions so far uh, through this session. Really appreciate it. Um, and we certainly encourage you all to ask your questions throughout this process. So we have a little additional time um, to directly respond to questions you may have now. But just a reminder, um, if you have questions after the session, um, you can send those questions to core funding at santacruzcountyca.gov. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, the questions that have been asked so far or that were submitted by June 14th um, will be posted later this afternoon. And then all questions that um, uh, come between now and the deadline of July 1st at 5 p.m. will be posted in a second Q&A response um, by July 8th at 5 p.m. So you still have time outside of this um, session, but I wanted to uh, create some time here for you all. Um, you have questions now, um, things you thought of that you haven't asked along the way. And so if you have a question, if we can ask, we'll get a cue going if you can raise your hand um, and or continue to drop questions in the chat. And just like we've done so far, we'll do our best to answer uh, the questions that we can, clarifying questions in the RFP. And if there's certain questions that um, require a little additional detail, 
Uh, we'll let you know that, and they will be included in uh, the uh, Q&A posting for questions. And so I see that Kimberly already has her hand up. Thanks. I just realized uh, that we missed a question from earlier. I don't think we responded to that we're able to respond to pretty easily. Uh, there was a question from Carol Safin about uh, the there's a RFP um, question regarding uh, whether a grant writer is used for the application. And I don't think we responded to that question earlier. And so that she asked, does the answer to this have an impact on the way um, one designates a score on their response? Like for example, will there be more weight given to professional grant writer versus a non-professional grant writer? And uh, and I can I can answer that no, there is no um, there is no different weighting on the response to that question. In fact, that question isn't rated. Thanks, Larry. I just that was Great. buried earlier. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly, for that clarification. Um, and again, just to clarify all the questions that we have here through. So uh, we are tracking all your questions that have been dropped in the chat so far, and we'll make sure again as we go through, they're all being captured and will be responded to. Okay. And with that, any other questions? I see a couple more questions coming through the chat, and I there may be a couple others from earlier also that I don't think got addressed, or maybe I missed it. Um, so if it if it helps, Larry, do you want, do you want me to read out loud some of the ones that I see? Okay. Um, so there was a question earlier on um, that was in the same vein as some of the other questions asked earlier. Three core conditions of health and well-being do not neatly cover the scope of what our organization does as a poverty-fighting nonprofit in the county. Any advice for organizations like ours? I would say that um, to just, if you have a program that you've that you feel fits in there, just choose the choose the core condition that most fits the program that you want to uh, apply fund for funding for. I hope that helps. And I'll just put in a plug for um, the TA <laughs> that although we can't tell you like here's the core condition you should apply for or you'll you know you'll get funded if you apply under this. We can help guide you through through a thought process so that you uh, basically using kind of a logic model approach, you know, thinking about what are the outcomes that your program is intended to produce, what are the activities you do to create those outcomes, and then based on that, which core condition and impact statement seems to fit best with what your program is designed to do. Um, the next one that I don't think I've heard an answer to yet is um, for clarification, a 501c6 with a proposal that falls within one of the three priority areas may apply, but must apply through a 501c3. Is this correct? Um, we'll have to do some, some digging to get you a definitive answer, but my initial answer is I believe that is correct, that a 501c6 would need to have a, a fiscal sponsor that's a 501c3. But we'll take that question and get um, a definitive answer. Those were the two from earlier that I think I saw that hadn't been addressed yet. Um, Larry, you tell me if it's helpful. I can. Yeah, read some of the newer ones that we saw, or if you want to pick it up from here, I yeah, think it's Stacy's. Take it up, and we can kind of do a little bit of tag team. Would be sure. great. I think I saw one that was a little bit earlier that asked about uh, the uh, the timeline for publishing response to questions, and hopefully, I answered that at the onset. I think that question just came in a little bit earlier. Um, so again, we're posting the first round of questions that were submitted from last Friday up to last Friday this afternoon, the second posting of questions that are received by the deadline of July 1st will be posted by 5 p.m. on July 8th. Oops. 
Um, and then where are we picking up now? So um, the first question I see here is for question eight, does every A activity link to a B field or is B a calculation across the described activities or services? I think, I think that relates to how it's presented in reviewer. Uh, George, are you able to answer that or should we take that off and respond to it uh, formally in writing? Um, why don't we answer another question and I'll, I'll double check the, um, okay. RFP. Thanks, George. Uh, the next question uh, that we have in the chat is this may be in the information already provided, but how does the city funding versus the county funding impact for programs that are located in and serving city residents? I can say that uh, it's similar to the last um, RFP round that the city, the so we're it's a joint process that we do this RFP process and review and awarding of funds. Mm -hmm. Um, though the city of Santa Cruz funding is used for programs that primarily serve city residents. Uh, having said that, that doesn't mean that, so county funding is still also used for city residents, but the city of Santa Cruz funding is used for programs that primarily serve city residents. Um, I, I'm just going to jump in because that was my question as Carolyn um, Coleman. So is is the city funding included in that 3.79 million? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, and the next question, um, and this is from uh, Eliza or Eliza, apologies if I said that wrong. If our organization received core funding in fiscal years 22 through 25, are we eligible to apply for the 25 through 28 core funding? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Assuming you haven't been disqualified for receiving funding from the county, then or or the city, then you would be eligible to apply. Thank you. And then I'll I'll jump back to Stacy's question on question eight, which asks um, agencies to list the activities that they'll be providing through the um the the core funding. And so yes, so that what you would be doing is you'd be describing what the activity or service um, that you'd be providing and then in question B, the total number of activities or services um, that you describe in A. So if, for example, if you're going to provide mental health, health counseling sessions, um, you would say how many mental health counseling sessions would you provide on an annual basis um, through the, through the um, core for funding, and then uh, question C would be: At what point is your program going to implement those services or activities? Um, so I hope that responds to your question. That that helps, George. I will jump in with clarifying: is that we can have up to six activities. So my question was: Let's say activity one A links to one B and one C, and then two A, a second activity would link to then. A second B numeric field. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question in our queue, are there any major changes when compared to the current grant RFP that was submitted in fiscal year 23? That is probably a matter of perspective. <laughs> um, <laughs> There are some changes. I'll, I will say that um, the the um, we did a presentation to the board on April 30th, um, in which we delineated the major, major changes between the last RFP and this RFP. I think I, I will give a couple, um, but I but uh, we'll take this and respond in writing, referencing the um, materials from that day. But a couple high level ones are um, the that the, we've narrowed the number of core conditions. Last time there was no specificity around which core conditions people could apply for. Now we've narrowed it down to three. Um, there's also been this uh, the 
funding for stable and affordable housing is going to be handled through a separate process. Uh, another uh, difference is that those large agencies with revenue above 7.5 million are not eligible to apply for the small size grants. And we also uh, changed and simplified the uh, panel review process, meaning particularly uh, we tried to make it easier for people to qualify to be reviewers for the applications. Um, and so we would have a more um, expansive and inclusive and diverse um, set of panel of reviewers for the applications. Um, I think there's like, I think there's one other that I'm, I'm missing. We've scooted up the timeline quite a bit so that uh, recommended awards will be completed in the, um, by winter of this year so that organizations have time to prepare for either starting their programs or winding down programs if they um, are not going to be funded in the next round. And oh, that the other thing that is different this round and not specific to the RFP, but just to this total core process is that um, there's a, a portion of money that is set aside for the elected officials to um, utilize towards any unanticipated priorities that may come up at the time that we're doing uh, awards. I think those are those are a handful of the, the high level changes. Uh, but again, you know, we'll take this and when we do our response in writing, we'll, we'll reference a document that lists everything. Great, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, the next question uh, is, what ages are considered by the county to be older adults for the thriving families category? Uh, go ahead, George. Thanks for this um, question, Danu. Um, this is um, one of the questions that came in to our um, our written questions, and we'll have a, a response later this afternoon. Um, but for the purposes of, of for funding, older adults will be those age sixty and over. Thank you for that clarification. Um, the next question: um, uh, Curious about the indicators for each priority. Do our programs need to rely on the indicators in data share? Uh, no, they can. Uh, there can be. They they do not need to be limited to data share. Uh, data share includes examples of indicators but you do not need to rely solely on those indicators. And the next question is, where can we see the character count for each question in the application? And can you advance the next page if you have not completed all the questions on the current page? So um, I'd, I'd have to double check, but I'm, I'm fairly certain in Revere when you're filling out a question, it'll tell you what your character count is. Again, this will be, you know, if you go to the technical training next week for review or some of the, you can um, explore more of these. And then um, you do, you do need to have um, some response to the required questions in order to go to the current page. So even if you just put placeholder and then hit next, you can then go to the next page, but in, until you have something in each field, you won't be able to advance your proposal. Great, thank you, George. Um, the next question goes back to something that was asked earlier about results-based accountability. Um, and then Kimberly had responded that it had a more comp, and said, it said had a more complex answer. And um, this comes from Reverend Beth Love Heat. Um, just wanting to clarify how results-based accountability applies across contract cycles. Uh, that's a helpful clarification, I think, for the question. Um, and I think I could answer it by saying that at the start, each contract cycle is, a, is its own cycle. So and with the current contracts, each organization has a set of, uh, of goals and target outcomes, and they're reporting each year on how they're doing in relation to those goals. 
uh, and as as the county, we also work with people to try and achieve goals if they're if they're struggling. You know, we we um, we provide that support as well. Um, and so, at, when this contract cycle closes and the next one starts, the next contract cycle for each organization awarded funding will be based on the application that was basically submitted for this coming RFP and the contract that is established based on that proposal and that program. So it, it's a, then the tracking for that program and that funding cycle starts from the point that that contract starts. And I, I hope that that's, that helps, but. It's, it's not exactly getting at my question, if I may um, jump okay. in here. So yeah. um, as an organization who has um, core funding for the first time this cycle, um, we worked really hard to have um, to meet and exceed our outcomes and did exceed almost all of them. And I, it, I'm just, the question is, does that count for anything in the next round or not? Um, the fact that we, you know, within a framework that's called results-based accountability, that mm -hmm. was our assumption that if we, if we get our results, there's going to be, you know, that, that would, uh, that would make it more likely that we would get funded again. And I'm, I'm kind of hearing that's not true, but I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Oh, that, that is, you are, you are hearing correctly. There's um, with the core RFP process, there's no preference given to organizations that previously received funding. It's a, it's a new slate. Basically. Oh, I wasn't talking about previously received funding. I was talking about for those that did previously receive funding and did well, there's right. there's no points or anything. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question, it's another kind of age definition um, inquiry. And so what is the age range for children and youth in the thriving families core condition? Again, um... Helen, this is something that was asked several times um, up and will be um, put into the question and response document that will be issued later today. But um, for the purposes of CORE, the age range will be uh, age 0 to 24 will be children and youth. Thank you for that clarification. Um, a question that is wondering about the discretionary funds that the Board of Supervisors will have control of. If a project can be made to fit within one of the three priority core conditions, but really fits best within one of the other core conditions, would you recommend agencies approach the Board of Supervisors about the discretionary funds? I think that's a hard one to, I think that's a hard one to answer. Mm -hmm. Um, because it'll really uh, every everything in the core process ultimately is decided by the board. You know, they'll the one they'll be the ones that um, vote on the awards in the end. They'll the one they'll be the ones to choose if there's any additional priorities or um, and additionally um, how they choose to. Um, I utilize this um, funding available for um, unanticipated priorities or needs, and so I I can't I can't recommend um, what you would do. Um, it's just really, yeah, you know, I think up to whatever the organizations um, feel is best. Great, thank you. Um, can you say more about? impact statements that you have mentioned, is that something in writing and where can it be found? I'll, I'll take this one, um, Carolyn. Um, this, and I'm gonna post in the chat the link to, to data share, and then I'm gonna show it on um, screen here. Um, uh, the core results menu um, has all of the, the um, eight core conditions, and then it has links to the impact uh, statements underneath. So for example, um, 
lifelong learning and education. If you wanted to learn more about equitable access to high quality education and learning, you would click on it and it would give you um, some indicators that it, for that impact area. Um, and so that's um, where you can find more information. And then also I'll make a plug for um, Nicole and Nicole's uh, TA. This is also something that you could get assistance with through through their um, technical assistance. And then another impact statement related question um, in regards to thriving families and the impact statement of increased resilience. Does the county have any additional information on the definition of resilience for the purpose of the core program beyond the broad and general definition? And do we need to align with one of the indicators already listed on the data share site? I think we asked answered that before, but we can hit it again. Or can we submit applications with areas of impact beyond the indicators listed? Correct. We uh, yes, you do not. Uh... There's no additional information on the definition of resilience um, it, it, for within the RFP, at least. And uh, as I mentioned a little bit with another in an earlier question, that you are not limited to the indicators that are listed on data share. Great, thank you. Um, in the last round, the tier three application was quote unquote easier. Uh, is that still true? Um, so in the last core RFP, we, we tried to design the various tiers to have different requirements in the proposal, hoping that would um, make it uh, quote unquote easier. This time around, <clears throat> what we've decided to do is make the questions the same across all tiers. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say that any one is easier than, than another. Great, thank you. Well, we did attempt to simplify the application overall. Thank you. Um, is there a link that breaks down eligible focus areas, um, the three categories of funding? I think maybe for the three areas, three categories of funding. Is that question clear? Or um, I think Can yeah, I, I think this relates to we've. I think this re may relate to the um, there's the core conditions and the impact statements, and um, where there's like you know focus within those core conditions. And if I'm interpreting that correctly, um, I think I'd, I'd hold off on answering that at the moment, just because we've, we have received a handful of questions about the impact statement specifically um, that, um, that we'll respond to as a whole in a bit. Though I can say that within the um, data share website, where there's the core conditions, each of the core conditions has links to various impact statements. And one was shown uh, just a, a bit earlier by I think George or Nicole. Kimberly. Uh, since lifelong learning only has data for ECE, early childhood education, does that mean it really is about childcare or just that we can use other data and there is interest in targeted equity-driven adult learning? Uh, I think this is similar to a question that we received as well. And similar to, well, the data in that category is just childcare. Those are the, I think most, I think there is actually, uh, right, there's an item related to uh, workforce readiness, I believe. So uh, I would say just, you're not limited to those indicators. So within the category of lifelong learning, you can identify what indicators meet, what you, uh, you know, the, the, the area that you're focusing on. Am I making am I making sense? I'm looking at George or 
even Nicole to um, help me out if I'm not being clear, but it's it's really up to you to choose the indicators that best fit what you're focusing on. Yeah, uh, uh, that makes sense to me, Kimberly, uh, at least that, yeah, the indicators and data share are, are available for you to use if you wish, but they shouldn't they should be considered the only indicators that you can use um, in your proposal. Thank you both for that clarification. Um, and it looks like this is the last question in our chat, which is good because I think we're right at our, our time, more or less. Um, is health and wellness not a category any, anymore, or is it now included within the new three areas that we have? Excuse me. So that is correct. Uh, previously, health and wellness is still a core condition, though it wasn't one of the, the it, does, it didn't fall into the narrowed down um, core conditions as a part of this RFP. Uh, this RFP is those few we've mentioned, lifelong learning and education, thriving families, and uh, healthy environments. <laughs> um, based on the program, it may fit into one of those existing uh, categories. So I see um, you've added in uh, thriving families. Uh, the program that you're proposing may fit into thriving families. Uh, it all just really um, is up to how you link the the core condition link your program and outcomes to that that core condition and impacts great thank you kimberly uh, uh, last thing i say is because many of the core conditions as you probably uh, many of you probably know are overlapping and interconnected so you know it does create some flexibility there thanks i just add to that kimberly because uh we've um, shared some things too in the trainings and TA sessions that have happened already that um, just, you know, echo what you just described. And because there are specific questions in the application where part of the score for the response is based on connecting <laughs> the response back to the selected. So like it really needs to, like there really needs to be a connection between again, the activities the outcomes and the core condition. Um, so it's not just like, oh, I think this is the one that fits best and I'm gonna still write my program, apply for my program the way that um, that I'm used to that like, so there is still a thought process that again, training TA, we can help you with. Um, the training that we're doing on Tuesday actually is focused on, um, you know, what can you find in data share versus what other sources might, might you need to uh, look at or look for uh, if you're looking for other indicators and you're not finding the data on data share. So if that is of particular interest to anyone on this call, that that is the focus of, of Tuesday's training. Great. Thank you for that, Nicole. Um, and thank all of you for your questions. Really appreciate it. Um, really helpful for this process, um, probably not just for yourselves, but for everybody else listening. So um, again, this isn't your last opportunity to ask questions. You can submit them via email. The deadline is July 1st, and uh, the responses will be posted on July 8th. And with that, I will turn it back over to George. Thank you, um, Larry, and for everyone for their questions. Um, I just saw um, Eduardo asked that, yes, all of those um, general um, TA sessions um, by the, the core consultants will be uh, recorded and posted, and we, we will have a, a link on um, both the HSC website and then the link that the Nicole shared earlier to the, the core, other core website that will have those recorded sessions. Um, and if you have questions or can't find it, you can always um, email the the email address that Gisela just posted, the core funding at um, Santa Cruz County CA .gov. Um, Okay, and with that, I'm gonna um, reshare my screen and turn it back over to Kimberly to share our timeline and, and some last steps. Thank you. Oh, uh, 
forgot to hit share. So I think we're good now. Okay, thanks. So uh, this timeline is uh, similar. This timeline is on the Human Services Department Corps webpage. This is at the bottom of that page. Uh, and it just shows you the, you know, the approximate, uh, the timeline of how we're anticipating things to go. Applications are due August 2nd. Um, it includes the timing of the, um, the at least two um, question and response periods that we will um, post. Uh, final Q&A will be posted um, by July 8th. It includes the uh, online portal um, TA session on June 26th, and that's in that application period category. Then we, um, once the applications are submitted, um, there will be the review period in August, and we'll have uh, panels reviewing applications um, we anticipate for um, uh, into October. These are approximate timelines. And then we will have um, we will have a report back to the board with a summary of the applications received in September, and then we anticipate going to the board and city council, and then we anticipate going back with um, final award recommendations, and uh, by um, by the end of November, by November, and that will be to the city. Um, City Council and County Board of Supervisors. Uh, and uh, ultimately I mentioned as well, this is a, another change from last time, but hopefully we'll be um, help some agencies uh, since um, awards will be finalized by the end of 2024, that provides a number of months, January through June to develop the new contracts for new agencies to ramp up or to wind down based on their situation. Uh, and then the next, should I go on to the next slide? Okay. Uh, so uh, we were just, it's this is what I'm about to cover is not posted yet, but we're just taking this opportunity to share. There will be an addendum to the RFP posted. Uh, if not today, then very early next week. Uh, the addendum is going to um, make uh, minor adjustments to the timeline for city, um, city and council approval of funding. We're actually scooting it up um, a bit uh, to uh, November. I think we previously had December. And that we also um, have a minor adjustment to the process for appeals, um, which, uh, Basically, it uh, provides, uh, it gives us a, we've extended the timeline for the response to appeals um, to 10 days. Previously, it was five. Um, part of that is uh, one, not knowing how many appeals we'll get to the recommended awards. Um, last time we had quite, quite a number. And um, so we made that adjustment. And then we've also uh, consolidated the process so that uh, when the um, county and city send the notify organizations that they are being recommended for funding or not. Um, they would, they, those that choose to appeal may appeal and the appeal process will be completed when we go to the board in, um, in November. And again, this will be in, in writing in the addendum that will be posted, but we're just giving you a heads up that um, there is this, uh, this minor adjustment and minor addendum that will be posted soon. Um, lastly, we've received a number of questions uh, related to the sample independent contractor agreement that is in the RFP. Um, that independent contractor agreement was really intended as just a sample but some of the links weren't working. And so we're, we're uh, reposting that to try and avoid some of the confusion that's, uh, that's come up. George, did you want to add anything? Did I miss anything? Um, no, um, again, we, we will um, send out an email when this addendum is posted to everyone. We, we sent the original message to, to everyone who signed up for this um, conference so that you'll know when it is posted and live so that you can go and take a look at it. Um, but again, um, the addendum doesn't change anything about the timeline for submitting proposals. It's all kind of post 
proposal submission. So please um, don't think that it impacts any of that and, and we'll um, let you know when it is um, completed. And then um, I'm not sure if there's one more slide, but I'll just uh, reiterate again. Oh, the proposed, the interest survey. So we will be sending out a, uh, a survey, a survey of um, sur a proposal interest survey. Um, if you are um, likely or considering applying for funding, if you can please just complete that survey. Um, what this does is it helps us get an idea of about how many applications we may receive across the different core conditions and tiers. And having that knowledge allows us to better prepare for um, the panel reviewers that will review the applications. It helps us know approximately how get a better idea of how many people we may need and across what categories. So if you could please do that, it'd be greatly appreciated. And, and really how I, I um, designed it so hopefully it'll take less than five minutes to complete. I'll just show you very briefly, but it's, I'll just make the plug um, for Kimberly. It really will help us try to increase the diversity of panelists when we know kind of what um, how many uh, proposals we're going to get and in what areas, because we really want to try to recruit from um, the community who can review these proposals and best um, inform how the money is being distributed. Um, we're, um, I'm hoping that we can, can get this by the end of next week. So that would be the June 28th. Um, will be what I send out in the, the email um, to groups. Um, and then to Carolyn's question about how we are soliciting for panel reviewers, we are um, <clears throat> working with uh, kind of the panelists that we had last time. Um, we're also working uh, with the city, with Larry and, and his, his network to recruit people um, in and around the city of Santa Cruz. And then um, our staff is also working with community groups um, particularly in South County to recruit, but um, I know you are all interested in applying and obviously um, you and the folks uh, that you work with in your organizations generally have conflicts for being on a panel, but also if you know <clears throat> individuals in the community that would be good panelists that you feel it could be impartial, um, we but uh, if, if anyone uh, who's interested, we would gladly talk to and, and understand their background and whether or not they would be a good fit as a panelist. So um, we've been trying to cast the net as wide as we can um, for, for during that process. Um, okay, I think that was the last, last thing, Kimberly. And I think that, so it's, we've said it a few times, but just to reiterate, make sure it's absolutely clear. Uh, we're tracking the questions that you've posted. We've given some verbal responses here, but we will um, post the responses in writing as you're completing your, um, your applications. If you move forward in the process, um, please, written, please reference the, the actual RFP and the, the written documents as you uh, move forward in that process. It'll, they'll be more explicit and, um, and clear for reference. And then um, that also ensures that everybody has the same information, whether they were able to participate on this call or not. Thank you. Thank you all very much for attending and asking questions and um, being interested in this process. Have a great rest of the day.